Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to Beyond Space, even at the Tundra. In today's episode, we will focus on um, planet formation. That's why our guest is uh, Professor Anders Johansen of the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He recently conducted a study that could improve our understanding of how planets form and evolve. Okay, so everyone, please welcome Anders Johansen. Hi, Anders. Hello. Hi. Uh, okay. So um, the first questions about your research um, the, in particular, what did you exactly find? Okay. So what we wanted to study is basically how, how Earth formed. Uh, and uh, we also wanted to understand uh, two things about Earth. That is how much, where did the water come from uh, on Earth? Obviously we need water for life. And we also wanted to study where carbon came from, because we also need carbon for, for life. Kind of to summarize, what we found is that we made a new model for how the Earth formed, and we found that we can get a very good match to the formation time scale of Earth and to the composition of carbon and water if Earth forms by accreting a lot of millimeter-sized uh, pebbles. So the Earth grows by accreting tiny millimeter-sized uh, pebbles that are sort of similar to sand grains in a sandbox. So okay, so in the, the like you said in the the, uh, the first uh, like stage of the planet formation, it's uh, like uh, uh, those uh, pebbles are more uh, water abundant than we previously thought, right? So it's uh, like uh, the the water is more common than that we were uh, previously thinking. Yeah, I think we should compare sort of the yeah. classical theory for getting volatiles to earth, and by volatiles we mean we mean uh, water, carbon, and so on. And then thought of what, what we were proposing. So the classical theory, which you will see in the textbooks, is that uh, Earth collided with some water-rich asteroid at some point. But yes. Earth actually formed completely dry. Then it collided with an asteroid at some point that had water and carbon. And so this is why we have these wonderful molecules for life here today. Uh, of course, this makes the uh, uh, delivery of water and carbon completely stochastic, completely random. That means Earth could have had zero water and zero carbon or we could have been covered in 100 kilometers of ocean. And you can see all of these extremes are probably not so good for life. Either the Earth would be a desert planet, or Earth could have been, if it had, it had could I with more asteroids, it would have been like a water planet with 100 kilometers of water that may be good if you're a fish, but maybe not so good for civilization, right? Uh, so what we wanted to study then is uh, basically, or basically what we found out is when we made Earth, not out of asteroids colliding, but out of tiny pebbles colliding, then we found out that it's not random anymore. Then the pebbles that are coming early are very cold. They, they are like little uh, sand grains that have that have frost on them and have, uh, had, have organic molecules inside carbon. And they come down to Earth uh, exactly in the amount that, that Earth has today. And since it's not random anymore, uh, I mean, your, your Earth is hit by billions and billions of, of pebbles. Then we can also say that it should be the same amount that came to Mars. To Earth, to Venus, and also to planets around other stars. So it's like uh, it also applies to to other rocky planets um, uh, that we know, right? In a solar system, or maybe even exoplanets um, in some distant yeah. Um, yeah, star systems. Uh, so uh, another question is that um, uh, your research, uh, your findings uh, could um, help us uh, search more habitable planets, more exoworlds that are. Uh, more uh, water abandoned with the underground oceans, something like that. Yeah, well, well, what our model would predict is that a planet like Earth forming around a star like the sun in the same distance would probably have the same amount of water uh, as Earth has, as if not 10 times more and not 10 times less. I think it's a really interesting question though, if the planet is not like Earth, if it's like Mars, so Mars is only 10% of the mass of the Earth, and we also have Venus that's a bit closer to to, uh, to the, the sun, and these planets are clearly not habitable now. Mars is too cold and Venus is too hot. So it's also telling you that even if you start with the same amount of water and carbon, very different things can happen depending on the runaway greenhouse effect in case of Venus or in case of Mars, Mars probably lost a lot of mass because it has so little uh, mass to hold on to, onto its atmosphere. They probably lost a lot of volatiles to, to, uh, to the uh, heating bar by, by the early sun. Yeah. Okay. So, do you plan uh, some further research on the on this topic um, uh, to continue the, the the to improve your models and uh, yes. yeah yeah very much very much so because we are so lucky in the solar system that we have Earth and Venus and Mars 
and they are so different planets that means we can calibrate our model to understand these these three planets. And I said the key here is yeah for Venus is that it's hotter, it's closer yeah. to the the sun. So somehow Venus has like a hundred bars of CO two atmosphere, right? Somehow the CO two on Venus never got into the mantle again. Uh, and this happened on, on Earth, but that Earth has most of the CO2 on Earth, the carbon is inside of the planet now. That's probably because the, the oceans could condense out a bit colder. The oceans could condense out and then bring the CO2 down into the mantle again. And then we have the difference with tiny Mars, cold Mars, a little bit further out, which has very little water and it's a bit colder. And there, probably the gravity of Mars matters a lot, that it has so low gravity that it can't hold onto, onto its atmosphere. So what I'm doing now is actually trying to understand the difference between these, these three planets in the context of our model. And then I believe once we have a good understanding of the solar system, then we can understand the exoplanets a lot better also. Yeah, so some uh, like super Earth uh, exo um, the exoplanets uh, similar to, to our planet, yeah, uh, like Earth to yeah. zero that we are looking for <laughs> uh, constantly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it's really exciting uh, that we can look for planets around other stars, but we also have to be realistic that it will take a very long time to study them. And we need more and more telescopes. So I still think, do, don't forget the solar system. We have neighbors, terrestrial planet neighbors here that we need to understand better also. And by understanding them better, then we can also understand if some super Earth or, or some Earth-like planet around another star is potentially habitable or not. Right. Okay, uh, Anders, thank you so much for um, explaining your your research, your study. Um, the, the, all, all the I think that uh, the, the audience will learn about about your your model, your 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 study that you're conducting. Once again, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you on our event. Thank you so much, Anders, and keep up the good work with you, with your research. Bye. Thank, thank you for having me. Bye.